very warm welcome. Very warm indeed, it is warm out. Um, so I do appreciate you coming and sharing this um, afternoon with us at Centre 42. My name is Robin Loon, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Centre 42. And um, I'll be moderating uh, today's edition of The Living Room. Now, The Living Room is one of our many programs where we talk to practitioners about um, experiences and, and our way of documenting the past. And I think it's quite important that we do so. And uh, we hear from the people who are in that, in that context and we'll be able to share to us into it. So today, um, we're very, very pleased to have with us um, three people who were part of the creative team that um, produced what, in my opinion, was one of the most iconic performances in the 80s and then subsequently in the 90s. And that is, of course, three children. And the playwright herself is here, Ms. Leo Poetin. And we have two actors, um, Ms. Claire Wong, who was in the 88 and 92 production, Claire, and, and Sing On, uh, Lung Sing On, who was in the 92 production. We're very happy to have them here to, with us today. So for those of us who don't recall or Dare ask we're the question. Born, we're, not we're, born we're not born in 1988. Now, if you indulge me, um, I was in national service at the time, and I was very much, uh, I was very much affected by what was going on in the theatre. So, at any opportunity, I can book out our Go Watch Theatre. And I have to say, when I went to the Drama Centre to watch this play, it completely blew my mind. I had never seen anything like this before. Of course, if you watch it now, it's probably quite commonplace, but cast your man back to 1988 when I was 20, National Service, coming out to watch a play like this, it was really quite something, and I think it marked a very serious turn in the aesthetics of Singapore theatre at the time. So, this is the opening sequence of the 88 production. <laughs>
among trees. Ride, ride, ride. Ride, ride, ride. On my horse, my faith. Ride, ride, ride. Riding among trees. Ride. And as you can see, when you enter drama center, lights, all lights were on. Right? The old drama center. Yes, this is the old drama center at Fort Canning. Um, lights are on. As an audience member, I didn't know why the lights are on. And then suddenly these people just streamed out. And then we realized as the show continues afterwards, then the audience light went off. And that was for the first time to me a very different experience in the theater. So I'd like to quote the two directors, um, the late Christian Jit and Mr. Ong Kang Sen. Um, and they said, the result was an intensity of performance unfamiliar to the Singapore audience. Our aim was to fuse past, present, and future into a singular event, better to shape a timeless zone for the play. We consciously abjured the familiar strategies of perceiving the past in languorous, sepia tones, and would set it apart from the present and the future. And <clears throat> and I thought this particular quote was quite good. Experience is furtive and fleeting, and we forget as much as we remember. And I think this is one of the things that we at Center 42 are trying to, to and we struggle with, the concept of remembering, documenting, and um, it's just what do we remember and what do we forget. So I'm going to start um, with Poetin, and I'm going to quote directly from what Poetin wrote uh, in the published edition of Three Children. And <clears throat> I quote, the three children's journey, which spans three generations, dwells into the debris of domestic trivia. The people of Kapan Road are common, ordinary, and their wrongdoings are commonplace atrocities. Their lives appear absurd and insignificant to outsiders. But there is a touch of heroism in this absurdity. Unassumingly, they find ways to survive their human sufferings and submit only to death. Their stories, each one unique, would have ended with their death, but for the storytellers in their community, the three children. So, Puetin, you've probably been asked this question a long time. Many, many times, take us through the genesis and the creation of this play. Actually, uh, Three Children began uh, five years before it became Three Children. In 83, um, for those of you who, who, who know uh, Christian Jit, a very important director uh, to Malaysia and uh, Singaporean uh, theatre scene, he invited me to join a project where he was experimenting with time and chance. And he wanted, uh, he needed a solo performer who would tell stories. And these stories had, uh, you know, uh, they had to be personal stories, autobiographical. So I offered to tell him stories from my childhood. So it became a project that's called uh, Tikam Tikam and the Grandmother Set. It was a horrible experiment. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it laid a lot of restrictions on me as a performer. So after that, we kind of, he abandoned the idea and I never went back to those stories again. And then five years later, I found that I could still remember all the stories because we had rehearsed them so intensely. And so I took leave. I was at that, at that point working as a journalist for the New Straits Times. So I took like two weeks leave. At that time, we were still using a uh, typewriter, so Olivetti typewriter. And I, in two weeks, I typed out stories. And, and they were like, they, they came in those shapes that you find in three children. You know, just like those, the shapes had been found. So my job was actually recollection, really. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then I had this problem of how do I sequence this? So the sequencing of three children led me to find a narrator. And then this, this uh, the metaphor of a journey. Like, why would they be telling this story? Right? So I created uh, this, this metaphorical journey of right, right, right. So they could just visit memories. And uh, basically, they were actually between two sites. You know, Jap uh, not Japan, China. <laughs> Old China, you know, which were grandmother's stories based on her experience uh, in a village in the south of China. And then their own lives in Kapan Road when they were, t uh, when they were children in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And so the, the journey for me then becomes, you know, because by, by the time I, I did, uh, I come uh, to, to write Three Children and to reflect, I was already in my 20s. And so this, is, this, is, this then became for me a reflection on what it meant to move from the working class 
which was the origin farmers, then work, working class in, in Malaysia, and then, you know, to become middle class. By which time I was a journalist, you know, our, our standard of living had changed dramatically compared to how it was in the 50s and the 60s. Yeah, so it became, yeah, it, th th that was actually how it started. It, there, there wasn't a conscious attempt to produce something like that. Mm -hmm. It was entirely accidental, actually. Yeah. Well, um, be that as it may, um, you're not a trained playwright, mm -hmm. but you were an actor. And you, so right now, looking back at it, yeah. this particular play had an extraordinary robust dramaturgy. Yeah. If we think in terms of how events move from one to the another and then they get picked up again. Yeah. And it is a very long kind of sequences that would, that are very cleverly put together yeah. in terms of how you introduce the Arpensium character, then you pick them up and the characters. And then within that, there's linearity, and then you break the linearity up, and it loops all the way back. And it almost feels as if every time it gets a little bit too frightening, the three children break back into this particular right, right, right sequence. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, so there is deep psychology, and there is also matched with the dramaturgy in it. So putting it together, so the published and produced version, was there a lot of um, reworking, or was it just... Like I'm just going to our oh, Christian and uh, and Kingston because this entire CUCU MBR was not in the original version, yeah. But which we'll come to that later. But actually, what was published in terms of prologue, Act One, storytelling, the sequencing. Can you tell us a little bit more, or Christian's involvement, or did you just try to tell the story in a particular way? Yeah. Uh... You see, prior to the published, the published version would be, I think, version three or version four. Uh, I'm, I I'm really am a chronic re uh, reviser. You see, between, remember the, the two weeks of desperate recollection and writing, that led to the very first three children, which was more, um, the right, right, right wasn't there. Okay, so it was, but I did find a kind of a shape to it. You know, uh, which uh, I, I can't explain to you how how I I structured that, but it had a flow to my mind that this would lead to this and all that. So while there were a collection of stories, there was a through line which might not be in which which was which might not be visible unless you really go and see what each nugget is trying to say. And that was actually tested out in uh, February 1988. And uh, by by Chin San Sui. So I was in one of he he did a, a production with two uh, alternate casts. So I was playing girl two in one of the casts. So after finishing it, I felt dissatisfied. Okay, but but I think I was prompted to do a revision also because Christian approached me about wanting to do the play again with Kang Sen in Singapore. So right after it was over, you know, I, I then I got the incentive to, to revise it. And that was when the narrator came in and the right, 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 you know, so that. So it became more and more, I was trying to provide a journey through it, right? So, and I think that you will find that, I can't remember exactly, but they, Christian and Kang Sen did intervene and I did uh, resequence, but not a whole lot. I think the, the, um, the Ang Tamui story was, was differently placed uh, because of their intervention. And also, Christian kind of retrieved maybe two stories for me because I didn't put them into the, either of the, of the versions, but he really liked, you know, if you put your hands on your breast, you will have a baby. <laughs> and so he, he kind of retrieved that line for me. Yeah. You know, there were some changes, but I find finally that, you know, I was happy with this version. So after the performance in 1992, uh, Two, right? I still did a further revision before it was published. Yeah. Well, I'm going to now uh, share with you the Ride, Ride, Ride sequence. Ride, Ride, Ride. Ride, Ride, Ride. Ride, Ride, There was once a something. Something like a temple on a hill. Like a well of sweet water. Where is it now? On my horse! My faith!
Um, just a little bit of a trivia. Uh, I remember in um, 88, um, well, after I watched the show, I was quite familiar with um, some of the actors, Ming Chu in particular. She was telling me that the first day of rehearsal, when uh, King Sen and Christian made her stand on the stool on top of the table, she couldn't do it because it was just so wobbly. And I would like to impress upon you that it is not easy to maintain your balance, to jump onto a table and onto a chair, and which they did a lot of times. So it took a lot of skill and a lot of training for them to actually do something that looks so effortless. So I'll come to that later with the actors because there's a lot more skills and a lot more training that, again, something that I had never seen in the theatre, the kind of going into traditional Asian art form. So... Um, Putin, if I could, if you indulge, if you could read the first three paragraphs from Act 1, Scene 1. Once upon a time, there were three children. Three children just like you. But they spent their early years in Kapan Road. When they grew up, they found it was necessary to return to Kapan Road a narrow street in Malacca town that ran alongside the Malacca River. Many years ago, years and years ago, before you were born, there were already people living in Kapan Road. Some of them who lived in Kapan Road were born there, others moved there from elsewhere, and some of them who moved there had once upon a time lived in faraway villages in old China. Thank you, Pujin. So. I just wanted to put in to read that because the whole idea and the concept of storyteller and storytelling is such an important element in this play, as Putin has talked about just now. And the introduce, introduction of the narrator and the whole idea of people remembering where they came from, who came, the new immigrants, people from the past. This particular um, opening line has such resonances with me now with so much talk about migration, so much talk about do you belong here, do you not belong here, go back to where you come from, and so on and so forth, that kind of, of discourse. As a writer, having, you know, there are many, many iterations of three children, what is your current reflection on what three children is right now? Or what do you think it says about where we are right now in the world? Maybe, Robin, I answer it in another way. Sure. I was actually very surprised last night to learn that Three Children has, uh, has been designated uh, a tax for Singapore O-Level. And it has been for well, a few years. I, I wasn't aware of that. Even though I knew the Ministry of Education, uh, you know, they had approached me to upload, I think, two scenes from Three Children. You know? And um, I, I was actually also very surprised because... Some time ago, earlier this year, I, I was approached by a Chinese uh, theatre group and they told me that they had taken the concept of three children. Uh, basically, three people go on a journey and they, and they name it after three children. They call it three children from Pataling Street or something, but they put my name down as the playwright. Okay. And they have performed it 150 over times in various places in Malaysia mm -hmm. because they wanted to use it as a vehicle to talk about Chinese culture and Chinese language, which they feel, even now, that is under threat, even under Malaysia Baru, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, so I th and then last night, of course, I saw you know, Bumi uh, Collective's uh, you know, uh, uh, response or the, their, their idea of three children. 
And I think that, you know, it's become a vehicle. I, I mean, I don't actually feel that I am like uh, the author. Def definitely, I noted these stories, but I think because of the, the sociological basis, you know, that these stories were not invented by me, did not come out of my head. So I was basically, of course, I had to shape the stories, but they were based on things that I observed as a child and also based on stories that my grandmother told me. And she was a very good storyteller, very direct in, in her depiction of even cruelty. So she had no, no like R rating, this is only you know, for children, this is for adults. You know, the, the cruelty will come out. So I think, I think that the, 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 the play, or at least the text, I think it's become a vehicle. You know, and, and various people, I think, can be used by various people to, to express you know, their, their current concerns, really. And I, I actually, I look forward very much. In fact, I was very happy that it was done, you know, there's a, a Malay element, because in Malaysia, three children worked very well when it was done in Chinese, particularly, even better than in English. In Chinese, whether it's Hakka or Hokkien or Cantonese, you know, there is a kind of vivid, the vividness of the experience just came through. It's just very, very strong. And I always wondered, you know, what would it feel like, or would it sound like if it were done in Malay? But not to talk about the Chinese experience. I wasn't asking the Chinese experience to be replicated in Malay. But for then, you know, the Malay culture, the Islamic culture, to also reflect on what it meant to grow up in a culture like, you know, in the, in, in the shared culture. You know, what, what, did, what did it feel like to, to confront suffering as children? Right, to, to confront, you know, to deal with the, the, the sufferings of our ancestors. How do you deal with that? You know, because you have, you have gone past that. It's as though the suffering is over, if you like, the hard days are, are, are over. But in a way, it's not true, because then you have fresh traumas, you know, in our, in our present lives. Then how do you reconcile the two, you see? So I think conceptually, you know, it, it is, it's, it, it's a vehicle that can be borrowed by, by anyone. I will, of course, I would love it if they say, oh, it's inspired by three children. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, as a concept, please, for me, it's a very simple thing, you know? Mm. Going back on a journey, and it's not, I, I don't think I have a, I have a holder to, to this mm. concept, actually. Yeah. But it is, to a lot of people, a very frightening journey to actually trace your steps back and look back, especially from where you are right now. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, when we are talking about three children, we're looking back all the way back to 1988, yeah. You know, it's like, goodness, what were we doing? We didn't know anything. And that kind of journey back, and that kind of retrospection, and that kind of reflection. So right now, would you have done anything different in the journey, if you could? I mean, I think the, one of the things about Three Children is that they all go back and they revisit these stories, yeah. right? And that's why the opening sequence is this, where are you going? Take me with you. I want to go with you. Yeah. They came to go back. So, any particular using this as a vehicle, would you have? I, I wouldn't have, but you see, I left the journey open, you see. So, you know, if you want to contemporarize it, it's very simple. Just continue that journey. Mm. So, they write, 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 and then what did they write into? So, I might have stopped in 1992, mm. but then you could continue the journey from mm. there. Mm. You know, and then I think it would be, you know, the journey into technology, which I never foresaw. Yeah. Right, and into, you know, in, into, yeah, into complexities which I, I couldn't have foreseen at that point. I think, you know, that, that would be anticipating family because mm. then it, mm. the times change and then I captured mm. the changes in yeah. another story, you see. Which you know, another play called Family, which King Sen adapted into a site-specific performance called The Young Family, but that's a different living room altogether. So I'm just going to move on to um, what the directors put into that um, collection there. And in truth, we did not come to a useful understanding of the adult world until we deliberately endeavoured to make concrete the social conditions of Kapan Road. Very little in the life experiences of the actors could allow them more than a superficial entry into the survivalist experience of Kapan Road. We found this out early because our first reading, in inverted commas, of the play asked each of the actors and directors the question, what in your life gives you entry points to the play? the session led to the withdrawal of one of the actors from the play. We did the mandatory field trip to Kapan Road in Malacca in 1988. 
Earlier, we even perambulated around the Singapore Chinatown in search of conditions and behavior similar to those we expected to find in Kapan Road. So, we're moving on to the actors now. Claire Wong. I have to tell you that before this play, I had also watched Claire Wong in a supernaturalistic play called Night Mother. <laughs> and I was so blown away. And then suddenly she was on stage doing all this. I was very confused. Because she, and then before that, yeah, so I watched her in Night Mother, and then I saw, I know, I know this actress, oh, Claire Wong, let's go watch her. And she was in a completely different mode, right? So first, how did you come up with Wong Chui Ling, Ding Ling Ling? <laughs> Roll up, roll down. What was that process like? Because the entire opening sequence is not in the play. So, did Christian say, okay, you all go and think about this, a jingle for yourself, and so on and so forth. Do you remember how that came about? We did a lot of preparatory work. Mm. Um, you would have read about the training, yeah. the tai chi, the Chinese opera. I think... I think um, then we were playing around with the idea of the Dike Barat, mm. right? So we were trying to make it our own uh, and, and a childlike en entry point into that. Um, and, and that was, of course, uh, Marion's Marius, and she came and she taught us that. I, I can't quite remember like why or you know why they decided that okay we they wanted us to have an introduction perhaps mm. it was it was part of the idea that yeah. we had this formal introduction uh, of the actors uh, and presenting ourselves in this childlike manner mm. uh, but yeah we, we just basically had to play around come up with our own little jingle so we were taught you know some basic dike barat moves and then the idea of then taking that and playfully creating something that was our own and I would say that that was probably um, the way that the directors were working with us as actors. They were sort of dropping things into our body, into our imagination. And, and then we, we had to use that in a, in a playful way to create our own way of performing the story, of playing these characters. So it's, 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 uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen this, uh, these <laughs> video clips in... <laughs> Decades, <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I. It's interesting the muscle memory. Uh, we we spent hours just learning about the whole vocabulary of uh, the horse vocabulary in Chinese opera. It's very intricate how you you know the, the, from step to step. Right, you have to mount the saddle, the reins, how you mount the horse, um, and in the end, of course, what we took and what we became this very powerful and important gesture uh, that, that, uh, was, um, that was for these children a way of also, it became much more than just a gesture, it became a way of escape, it, it became a way of running away or moving towards something. Because I remember after watching play, I just went like that, like that, like that. <laughs> because it was really very stark in terms of the, so can I just press you, can I just add, go. Okay, I'm just going to add something. This is a really interesting experience for me because we are unearthing our memories about memories. Mm. And I think I don't quite agree with Claire. I don't remember the directors dropping things. I just remember that we are mainly dropping, dropping things for us to pick up and do things. Because I, I remember know, we are... They we, dropped it into us. The, really? The idea I thought we were mainly motivated by fear. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, <laughs> seriously, that's why I remember we'd be waiting outside Black Box and they said, come in, create, create, create. And we just went on and on the whole day and then they just select a few things and the rest they just throw out. And then I remember everything was about fear for me. <laughs> it was like, okay, you must have fun. Okay, you have fun. <laughs> okay, I should give you two different contexts. In the 1988 production, they were rehearsing in Woolly Park. Yes. Right. Yes. In the 1992, they had moved it on to. Fort it was in Fort Kenny. It was in Fort Kenny. Very different. And they were working in air conditioned comfort, whereas in Woodley Park, they, uh, there I was more they fear, were, I think. There was more fear. <laughs> it was cold. So I, I would just wanted to, again, maybe come back to the distilling. So, yes, you were, as actors, you were put through all this training. And it's training that was meant to start from a very young age up to your. You were, forced to pick up this vocabulary. So how did you, one, kind of learn it, two, and distill that into this particular 
That means how do you adapt? Or oh, there's so much in the vocabulary. It's like the, there's a lot. I'm, I'll show a, a few clips later about that into this particular context. And what decisions did the actor make, or did the actor not make any decisions? Uh, into, oh no, I think the actors yeah. were very important. I, I'll talk more about the AA experience. <laughs> and and um, I, I think in '92 we probably went on to try to find new things, but the '88. Uh, experience was preceded by months of training. Yeah. A very, very long process of um, Tai Chi <laughs> and, and uh, Wuxi as well, I yeah. think, uh, martial arts. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic uh, Chinese opera classes with Joanna Wong, who's an amazing teacher, of course. Um, and, and it was that coupled with, yes, I remember um, what King Sen and, and Christian wanted was come in and there was this one exercise that's just so vivid in my memory is present. <laughs> right, just present, meaning you come on and you present whatever you're feeling, but it's it's a it's a still image, but it's it's intense, it's alive, it's not a dead image. Uh, but it's very heightened. And it was very, very stressful. But looking back <laughs> and, and and trying to you know, and if I to articulate the process, uh, because it is true, you know, Robin, what you said, uh, that was very, very um, landmark mm. in terms of an actor's experience. To give it some context, I had just, uh, a year before that, uh, of months before that, performed in the first production of Beauty World, as I reach out. And Beauty World is, of course, a very it's a musical, it's very naturalistic, but for me as an actor at that point, very young actor, it was the first time I got on stage and played a local character. I had to speak as I would off stage. Before that, we were all playing, you know, what we thought of were Ang Mo characters. So was, I think it was a very interesting process of claiming our space on stage as contemporary English language performers. So what was... I think very interesting, and I, and I do consider myself, yeah, in spite of the fear and, uh, and the stress, it was a very meaningful and very privileged for me to have somehow encountered this opportunity uh, where King Sen and Christian, I think, were themselves on a journey. Mm. And they were very much interested in finding a performance language for the contemporary mm. uh, Malaysian, Singaporean, English language theatre performer. Um, what, what else, you know, because we think of it as we've inherited this Western form, right? And, and we seem to think of it as we, we, it belongs to the West. But how do we make it our own? And therefore, we are also the repository of these incredible performing arts um, from Ch China, Indian, Malay, Southeast Asian, so rich. So it's the first steps, I think, that they were trying to... Um, explore what it meant to drop into the body of a contemporary performer these skills and you're right it's a it, it would you know i don't think we, we in any way tried to pretend we could become experts it was just about yeah you know, have it and then see what you would make of it and that was at the, the other part to the process which was to um, require us to tap on our memories and our imagination and it's a very specific, intense, childlike imagination which we, we lose, I suppose. You know, we had to really work, work very hard to tap into that. So how do you then bring those two together? Very intense, childlike imagination uh, with, these, with these forms and therefore the playfulness, have fun. Um, and I realised um, also it was very true to the heart of Putin's mm. plays, mm. Uh, this particular play where it is very much about going on a journey and, and childhood is terrifying, you know, it's not fun and sweet. Mm. Um, I mean, as you were reading some of the notes, I think the idea of intensity was very important. Mm. Absurdity. It was very, you know, we jumped from memory to memory and then and, and very emotional in the way that we have as children, the, the kind of dreamscape and flexibility and therefore the training of the body, the instrument to be able to 
one moment you're in this memory and the, mo the next moment you're in, another, you're in another place and your body has to be that strong, that flexible, that um, at your core. And I can actually bear testimony to what um, the trauma that Sing On is talking about because I've actually watched King Sen in action. So he would not only ask you to present, he will do this thing like change, change, switch, change, change. You're doing the same thing again. Change, 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 switch. Boring. <laughs> and he would just keep making you develop that particular vocabulary. And I think for this particular play, because even though it's about childhood stories, the stories are very dark. And they are very, very... There's a lot of sinister element in it. So the pushing the body to the limit was, that, was quite uh, important. And just that the getting... Sub well, I, I don't know whether it's subjecting the actors to, to that, but I think the ability to just immediately go and present and be that in that presentational style. And just to give you some context, um, subsequently, um, I mean, in a, more, in a gentler way, but again, Claire was involved in another production, which I love to bits, called To My Heart With Smiles, where it was the same. King Sen just everybody come, do the scene, short scene, do the scene, do. And then there was that presentational style. And then King Sen went away and came back and did Matt Forrest, which Claire was into. It was the same vocabulary of presentation, presentation. And it was very, very demanding of the audience to get into. Then, of course, for me, what will always mark my admiration of Claire Wong is her one-woman show called Madam Mao's Memories, which for the entire show, she played Jiang Qing, and it was that particular presentational style that she did from beginning to the end. And she looked exactly and behaved, and even though I've never heard Jiang Qing speak English, <laughs> It was really quite remarkable. And I, I don't know, I think it, that kind of level of actor training, because they were not formally trained actors. They were basically on King Sam victims who said, come law school, or come, come, do this play with me. And then they followed. And I think there was a lot of trust in that. So in terms of that journey, I mean, I mean I've listed all these, these performances that I've had the privilege to watch, all the way to Madame Mao, your crowning one woman show as far as I'm concerned. That training that you had in there, that you talk about muscle memory and all, were you, did you follow King Sen's journey or as an actor, I'm interested in the actor's journey, did, were you slowly realizing what you were doing and slowly adapting into, or were you driven by fear? <laughs> King Sen, don't scold me. <laughs> yeah, it, those were very, very, um intense actually it kind of sequential we kind of jumped from one project to the other and of course I think it built on it built on and it was probably I would describe it as a continuing journey into finding these um, these, these different language styles I think the idea of heightened reality height, heightened imagination uh, was what we were going for and the idea of um, tapping into the, uh, perf the actor's personal memories. I mean, I think in Three Children, we had a lot of sessions of going back into our own memories, so that was very, very important as well, and presenting those stories um, so that there is always a sense of your own um, connection with the character that you must access and to draw upon. I do rem and it, they were all very different um, in terms of the challenges. Certainly, doing Madame Mao's memories, oh, I, I remember being very, very... I, had, I, I broke down several times because I couldn't get this character. How do you access a character who was a historical tyrant? She was a murderer, you know, etc. I was reading her biography. So, the journey to enter into each of these characters was quite different. From Three Children, there were fictional characters, although, of course, based on real people that Britain knew or heard of as a child, to somebody like Madame Mao who is, you know, there are books about her there. And, and um, I, I guess it was an, a constant honing, a constant looking at how we can sharpen these skills. Uh, and, and looking back now, I mean, as a, 
director now, I, I realize, it, of course, it was very, very important for me um, to, 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 it's really like the actor, the physical body, and then there's the imagination, and then there is the imagined imagination as well, the character that I have also a, a, adapted into my own practice. Um, and subsequently, I went away to, to Columbia and I did my Masters of Fine Arts. And it's very interesting for me because up to that point, I was very much involved in the journey that King Sen was on uh, and Christian at that time. Uh, subsequent to that was when they launched the Flying Circus mm. Project, which was then a, a very intense series of looking at all the various different traditional performing arts in, in the world, right? It's Asia, Southeast Asia first and then beyond that. Uh, and I remember going to my class in Columbia University which, where I did my, my master's and, 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 and we were doing comedy air. And, and then I realized, oh, that's really interesting because in my body, the traditional Asian performing arts, we are very centered. We talk about the, the chi and the sense of the horse dance. You know, and all, I think even silat and everything, it's a very... It's grounded. And then we do comedia and ballroom dancing. And whoop, it's so, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, an in, and, and we did Suzuki, very, a lot of Suzuki. So it was very interesting for me to, to look at my, my, my training and what I brought into that mm. space. And, and then to, to see how I could then pick up these other more Western uh, forms of performing arts training. Um, and... And it's a, and I came back and I then did a, a, a play called Atomic Jai, which is another one woman play where I played 19 characters. And that was another level of um, satire and imagination. And I, I guess for me, I look back and how from Three Children to Madame Mouse to uh, Atomic Jai and then you know, Occupation, um, it, it is so much like the, somehow the tools that the actor has to rely upon doesn't change, you still have to do the work, you have to keep it honed, uh, but it is very much about um, having that flexibility of imagination uh, to, to move from one moment to the other, so vivid, intense, yeah. Well, the reason why I brought it up is I think the, the, the landmark quality of Three Children is not just the aesthetics, but how it raised an awareness of the kind it really was bringing a lot of attention to the actor. The actor was, was the primary. Right? If you look at the set, there's no set. It's just this. The musicians were on stage. I don't think you can see the parts of that, the musicians on stage. It's really very actor-centered. And a lot of the times, the actor were put through a lot in terms of the training. So King San and Christian had this to say about the 92 restaging. And they said, according to the playwright, there was no turning point in the play only a maturing of experience for the three children as they plunged deeper into their journey. We did not see this in the 1988 performances. Four years later, episodes had to be shifted and recast once we came upon the resolution. Beginning in Kuala Lumpur, uh, beginning in the Kuala Lumpur performance, we placed most, if not all, of the farcical episodes in the first half of the play. The story of Ang Tao Mui was transformed into a prologue for the beginning of the second half, and in effecting this change, we got closer to the social consequences released by the quote-unquote scandalous tale of the red bean soup girl. So again, this is what um, um, Quitting was talking about, shifts and changes. So I just want to show you, uh, this is one of the, uh, again, I only have the 88 footage. This is one of the farcical elements from the 88 production that I, will, I remembered. And this was all still in the first half the entire show with the interval, and thank God they had the interval, I don't think they were blasted, was about two hours. And they were on all the time, one after another, one after another, one after another, that amount of seminar. So this is the clip that was inspired <coughs> by the <laughs>
take the body to the river. They put rocks into the sack. They threw the sack into the river. Okay, so that was the, one of the farcical elements in the 88 production. So here we have um, Claire's bio in the 88, and that sing on, who says, what are you looking for? I've been looking for that something as well. I've run, walked around. This is the quote. Sing on, on his first visit to Kapan Road, I felt I was returning to my childhood, or rather my present memories of childhood, that life there seemed slower and gentler. So I'm going to come to Lung Sing on now. So... Sing on. Apart from fear, what else do you remember? Of? Exhaustion. <laughs> Exhaustion. Okay, so the original 88 production, did you watch it? Yes. Okay. So when you were told that you, uh, had, you were going to replace KT Lim in this role, what possessed you to say yes? Fear? <laughs> Why did you say yes to this? I actually don't remember. But I think, you no, know, like it's just one of those things, like you said, we've been working with King Sen mm. since the uni university, so he says, come along for the journey and you just join them. Mm. And I think part of the fun or the attraction then was also the possibility of travel. I think that was on the cards right. right from the beginning. Chance to perform in Tokyo, so that was a big, I mean, that would have be, been my first trip to Japan. Right. So what did you, because these actors, okay, it's been four years, but they would have had the training. Did you have to do a lot to catch up? Or did they just, did you join them? Did they have a refresher course? No, I, I remember going through the opera and I can't remember what else, but definitely we had to go through the training. But my, I think my, my, my runway was much shorter, so I had to pick it up much faster and then just jump into it. And the, when you pick these things up, how did you work? So um, the 92 production had two cast change. So the narrator was in this production is Nyo Sui Lin, and the narrator in the 92 production is Sang Keng Hua, and um, uh, Sing On was um, Boy One. So in terms of the dynamics, because you've worked with actors that you know, right? You know Claire for the longest time, Ming Chu. So in that environment, with them having their, what, what, what do you remember as the dynamics of the interaction and also in terms of like working and devising. Did you have to do a lot of devising or... Because according to King Sen, he switched the thing and turned it, kind of move a lot of things around from the original version. Were you participating in that or were you just, nah, given this, do? I think some of the decisions were made by, by the directors. The, the, for us, if I recall correctly, was this whole inventing thing like, from... from like 9 o'clock in the morning till the evening, you just had to go on creating, creating, creating. And I think part of the reason that, uh, part of, I, it was almost, I think, conscious to make us exhausted so that after a while you just gave up and you stopped thinking. Mm. Because if, if not in the, you know, in the earlier part of the day, you'd be so, it's everything up, it's up here. Mm. After a while, you just, just go in and just do whatever comes to your mind, first thing that comes to your mind. In terms of the dynamics, uh... This is my perspective. Mm. It was very often us against them. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Yeah. I remember all these sessions where after a performance, they come and say, okay, that was really shit and it was really useless. You better get together and talk about it. And we used to joke about this because we used to call this the compulsory fraternization. Mm -hmm. So the actors would get together after performance and then bitch, <laughs> bitch, 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 bitch. And then the next performance will be, will be for some reason better. <laughs> so... I, maybe I want to ask um, 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 Claire and Sing On about this. What kind of a director, I mean, we all know what kind of director King Sen is. What kind of director was Christian in this process? I mean, I don't think we've ever had a situation where King Sen and Christian directed this one production again. So not only did you have one on King Sen, you had on King Sen and Christian. Was it like good cop, bad cop? Or was Christian just smoking a lot at most of the time? You know, bless him. You know, what was it like working with Christian? What was Christian like in that process? I don't know about Claire, but I saw them as one unit. <laughs> <laughs> they never contradicted each other. There's always a united friend. Oh. Claire, what was your memory like? I remember... 
Christian was actually very soft-spoken, mm. um, and he's, he spoke very gently. Uh, I, I think that I don't remember them terribly being... You're right, I think they did plan, they did come in to rehearsals with, with uh, quite a joint vision or a, a goal of mm. getting something from us that day. Mm. Um, and I, I suppose when I look back now, uh, what was wonderful, yes, it was, it was very, very demanding, very mm. exhausting. I remember I would be, you know, we'd be rehearsing until very late at night. In those days, we all had to have a uh, day, day job, day jobs. But, you know, so we had no social life whatsoever. We would rehearse till 1, 2 a.m., no week weekends would be rehearsing. So I'd be like falling asleep as they're giving notes because you're so tired and you have to wake up the next morning and go to work in the office. Uh, but I, I, I think that they were very much, Christian was very much about a, a, an exploration and a curiosity, which mm. looking back now, I, I do appreciate. I do, I do realize that it wasn't as if they knew or mm. he knew what they were going to get mm. at but they knew what they, were, they wanted to explore. Mm. And yes, we were very much um, their, their means of exploring mm. those ideas. Mm. What would happen if we got these actors to do this? What mm. would happen if we pushed them to, 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 to this point mm. and, and, and something else takes over in the imagination and the need to devise mm. and create on the spot? Mm. So I think that they were very much um, working things mm. out. Um, and I, I do get the sense that they didn't. They didn't know. They didn't mm. know. Um, generally, they didn't know. Like I said, generally it was the actors who'd invent things. Except I was told there was one particular scene, one particular character, which I could never get. Try this, that, and the other until someone hinted to me because they wanted K Tong, and what he did was uh, a toothpick or some particular character. And I think they were looking for something like that, and I just didn't know what they were looking for. Mm. Wow. So did you? What did you end up doing then? Or I can't remember for that character. I can't remember what it was, but it was different from what I, I think it was different from what I was told they wanted. Wow. Puitin, did you watch any of these sessions? Or do you remember any? Were you invited to come and watch or whether the 88 or 92? Yeah, I was. In, in, in those days, it was the custom to involve the playwright. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think that I had a lot of objections. Maybe mm. once or twice, you know. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I kind of disagreed with certain choices they made. Um, and of course, it was I could, I could see the actors were exhausted. Mm. Yeah, but now this this is looking back, mm. you know. And, and uh, you know, I just want to say something. I think uh, I have I worked with Christian for twenty years, mm. and and uh, uh, Kang Sen is really watching him directing two of my plays, and that's about it. It's more, it was more peripheral. Mm. So I think where Christian was concerned, if I may say, mm. okay, that I feel that you know, Christian began, and, and I think Three Children was the beginning. You know, it was not the beginning. He actually began much earlier when mm. he was doing Malay theatre. Mm. You know, and that's the phase that I was not, I couldn't see it. I only saw the last show, and I think Singapore didn't see that. So this, this experimentation with the body had been going on for a very long time. Mm. But you must, you know, when he began, I think, working with the Malay actors, for instance, the Malay actors owned, they were very physical and they owned their culture. They mm. had language, they had poetry, they could sing, dance. You know, there, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of skills already embedded in the body and therefore it was just to, to get them to realise the script. And, and for me, Christian's method is really close reading. There's no, no mm. magic to it. Mm. The actor uses... He, f he is pushing the actor, or his responsibility as a director is get to, to get the actor to experience every word through the body. So it's not an intellectual close reading, mm. but a close reading using the physiognomy, the, 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 the physiology the of the body. And I think the, the, the crossover point would be like, say, three children, where he was actually you know, embarking on a training system and it was actually ex very experimental. Mm. Uh, I think, I'm not sure about Kang Sen, but certainly to Christian, he never had to train actors until he encountered this play, mm. which called for Chinese opera uh, elements, which was not in his vocabulary and which was not in your vocabulary too, in, in, the, in your body. Yeah. And therefore, I think that phase of training was really experimental. Mm. Right? I, think, I think Christian you know, used... 
you know, put uh, actor training as part of his directing and rehearsal mm. process until somewhere along the way, I think he stopped. Mm. Because it was costing him too much time, it was not working. I think mm. not working in a, not, not that it didn't yield results, it did yield results, but it, it couldn't be systematized. You know, so every production be something else. So I have, you know, I sat in for a lot of Christian rehearsals and I could mm. see, oh, he's doing this. But you, you could see at the base, you know, it's the same. He's trying to get the actor not to internalize, mm. but to experience the script viscerally. Mm. You know, right, from the outside and mm. it goes in and it comes out. And I think, you know, the, the last part of Christian's career, and I was very happy because I happened to be, I happened to spend the last five years when he was alive. He was in Singapore and mm. so was I. So I could watch a lot of his last productions. And I think, you know, he had more joy mm. and more peace and more, and more, more leeway as an actor because he left aside actor training mm. as a director. Mm. He, the, the actor training wasn't part of the process mm. anymore. So he began to audition highly skilled actors mm. and he chose scripts which didn't require opera or Chinese opera <laughs> training, whatever. You know, so, you know, so they were in the same medium mm. you know, and, and therefore the working process was actually very beautiful to watch because mm. that's where his imagination was unleashed. Mm. And I really felt that the best things that he did were in the last five years of his life, mm. and uh, well, happily for you guys, it was done here. Mm. I don't know whether you saw you saw it or not. Yeah. You know, so I would agree that it was very stressful to watch, even. Mm. But it was done out of a frustration. To to now I got the word. He was trying to create multiculturalism in the actor's body mm. where it wasn't available. Mm. And this was why, you know, later he came to, you know, to theorize that, you know, the Malaysian actor's body mm. was actually multicultural. And in a sense, it's true. Mm. We all have a bit of silat in us, hypocrisy, we can joke a little bit, <laughs> you know, we can imitate, you know, there's a kind of vocabulary, uh, you know, that mm. suited the kind mm. of plays, you know, that he had chosen to do, mm. right? J just, just to explain, like, why, why might some people experience, because we had radically different versions of experiences with Christian. Mm. I loved um, all my work with Christian. Okay, I love watching him work, you know, I, but that's me because I think maybe imaginatively I maybe operate in the same way or mm. culturally I was closer to him. But I also seen him, seen people feeling very tortured. <laughs> and she looks at me. Yeah, <laughs> as one example, but you're not the only one. Is yeah. it? But I think, if I may, I could explain that this is where, you know, this, this, this missing element he was trying to fit in mm. at the shortest possible time, you know, whatever he felt was lacking mm. in the actor's body. Mm. It's nothing to do with the talent. Mm. It's like you don't have yeah. the skills to express yeah. what I think should be there. Yeah. yeah. I think just to kind of um, be, if I may, I've spoken to King San about this. His frustration and alienation was um, with this cultural heritage that he's quite alienated from. Um, he speaks Hinghua, but he doesn't really speak Mandarin, and he always considers himself monolingual. And he works with primarily English language actors who will know of these traditions, but it was not internalized in them. So I think the whole thrust of getting you to, it's like breaking down the Western educator or the English yeah. educator to you so as to let something else in. So, Running with this alienation that he, that's why I think, I mean, I suspect that's why he started Flying Circus Project, as what Claire said, to reclaim, right? What was ours, or just to get in touch. So when, when, sing on, when you were like doing Chinese opera and all that, did, was there a, a level of alienation that, oh, I'm, I, I'm Chinese, I'm supposed to know this, but why is my body, or so on and so forth, was there any of that, and did that, contribute to the performance or did you find a way of dealing with that or was it just okay this is just something kings asked me do i just have to go and do it i mean looking back right now in terms of your engaging of these traditional art forms i come from an english speaking home mm. quite my I'm, I'm not particularly my family is not particularly chinese so so all these things like chinese opera were quite alien to me so i didn't even, even watch chinese opera but I think um, the learning itself was quite interesting. It, mm. it was actually fun. I mean, it was a, it, it was a, it's a window almost to a different world. Mm. So I, I actually enjoyed some of that. 
And when did you have the same experience as Claire did that you had you, you had a much shorter time frame and did you extract quite a bit? What was your process like when you had to distill or was it I think for some of those things choices had already been made. Mm. I think they actually went through more experimentation and mm. much more, uh, they, they went through a lot and then they, the directors finally chose. So like, the, uh, if I recall, the, the, the horse and all that, that was, was already established from 98. So 88 okay. and it was for me to just, in a sense, replicate what was already done. Right. Okay, just to show you another clip, this is an example. Now, what I find particularly remarkable about this production and subsequently in 92 is that they played children, so they have to have that child likeness, but it was never really a kind of a stereotypical child. -like. But yet they still have to master these traits. It was like children playing with Chinese opera or what they think of Chinese opera, but yet the skills were there. And just to give you an example. Of a <laughs> That was an example. You could see um, Kei Tong's character break into the child again. How am I so, so cruel and going back in? That kind of an aesthetics of moving in. As we know now, it's classic Brecht of just like distancing yourself, 
that kind of way. And then if you had seen the, the footwork and the crawling on the knees, those are really years. And it's really quite remarkable how these actors with no formal training in the arts could have come and did this. And again, distilled and adapted all that into this particular sequence without trivializing either. And I think that's one of the, the, the greatest things I realized about this production, that it took the art form seriously, uh, it didn't feel exploitative, well, maybe exploited the actors quite a bit, but <clears throat> it didn't feel as if it was um, appropriating anything. It just felt like one of these productions that I think the, the elements came together quite well, and they were all very well put together. Now, this is a question I'm going to ask both Sing on and Claire. When you travel to KL, for your out-of-town premiere, what was it like? Did, the, did, you, did you get responses? or Because I think the KL production, the Japan production had, was the only one that had a different narrator, right? You had a local narrator. So King went to KL, and what are your memories of the Kuala Lumpur premiere? <laughs> I remember it was really exciting being on the road, and you know, you know for once, you didn't have to have your day job. So it's like, wow, we're like real actors, <laughs> rehearse and then go and perform. And so, so that was kind of fun. But I also remember it was like quite sad at times because I remember the first trip to Tokyo. It was my first trip to Tokyo. And the very first day, we were inside this room rehearsing, rehearsing, and outside was Tokyo. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so... Do you remember anything else about Tokyo? Did people come up to you? Did you get any responses? Yes. I remember... Okay, there was one very interesting performance. The last one was Yokohama. Mm. And you talk about this being stark. I mm. remember Yokohama, it was just fluorescent lighting and nothing else. Because for some reason, I can't remember what was it, they couldn't get the lights to work or whatever. So it's just from start to finish, just bright fluorescent lights, except wow. dark out, uh, blackout. And I remember the Japanese audience two girls sort of like waving and crying at the end of the show as we, as we were going off in the bus. Wow. Claire, what was your memory of... <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I think the Malaysia, for some reason, I, I don't... I think the impact in Malaysia... Uh, people didn't quite know how to take it, I believe. Um, because and I and I think also even in Singapore because it was so it was so in your it was so in your face yeah. it was so heightened. Uh, it probably took a while for people to process, mm. you know. So I don't have very strong memories in terms of the audience reaction, but except I think I I do think there was excitement. Mm. I do get a sense that there was excitement, but the articulation took a while mm. as to why they were excited about mm. it. Uh, I remember Japanese audiences being very quiet, <laughs> but I realized that that is the case. They 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 are quite tepid in their mm. applause, but it didn't mean that it didn't translate. Mm. Interestingly, I think they they got it. Mm. You know, I I do get a sense that in yeah. in a strange way because the idea of um, impressionistic, a bit more abstract, mm. non-linear, they they accepted that. Right, uh, and then. Months later, we probably we got the translations of the reviews. Japanese reviews, oh. and they were they were good reviews. So that was very very exciting. Yeah. I don't know whether you know about this, but it was politicized in Malaysia. Do you know about this? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> it was politicized. Yes, there was a big re reaction for yeah. me as a playwright. Um, you know the the segment that was just shown about the beauty parlor accident. Mm. A woman was electrocuted. That that got me into a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, um, the reviewer actually got luck to draw a cartoon of me and Christian, our you know, caricatures, in a cot. And the headline was, uh, children, you know, don't play with fire. Yeah. <laughs> because that was, the, the reviewer is actually someone I knew. He was my lecturer in the University of Malaya. So, he saw that as Leo Poitin, the playwright, you know, whether consciously or whatever, my psyche, you know. I had the intention to kill Malays. You know, so of course I was I was very shocked, but I could understand you know where that discomfort came from because of the actually all the scenes to do with death were, were exaggerated. It was not just that particular scene mm. because that was the style, and you know, everything was like a cartoon and you know and uh, and so 
but you know, if if we're playing on home in playing on home ground and you see that scene, and especially with the, I'll come back later and take you home, you know, that is like you know, they, they, I think you know, there's a kind of a sensitivity was touched, mm. and people felt that they were mocking the Malay language, if not the accent itself. You see, so you know, despite you no, know, uh, said look, guys, you know, there is no such intention because because that really you know is you know about urban myth, right? Mm. And so that was actually one of the stories, you mm. know, that, that I, I inherited, I heard as a child. And so, I, I mean, it's very hard to explain it away. You know, of, of course, you know, we are talking about a Chinese enclave, you mm. know, where there was, if you like, a stranger. It, it's not that we had no Malays uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the actual, in the reality. But in the world of the Chinatown, very few Malays actually came there. Mm. You know, that was how it was in the 60s. Very little interaction, you know, we were segregated, if you like. But anyway, the, the difficulty for me was not then. You know, then we kind of passed and people knew I had no intentions. By the way, I came to, uh, no, you, you guys are Singapore. I came to Singapore in 1993 and I did a production with three Malay three, actors yes. now. And do you know what I was accused of privately? I was valorizing the Malays because we were using silat and, and et cetera. So I feel that this, this racial thing, you know, it's, it's just like where you are and, and it's a game, there's a ball that's being tossed around. Mm. And kind of, and so in my head I could square it because it happened uh, just uh, like one or two years apart. Mm. But my difficulty was, you know, two years ago when, you know, uh, re, uh, three children was due for publication, republication, mm. and they were going to include three children yeah, in, in the anthology staging histories, I really had to think very hard. Do I drop the word Malay? Because there was, there was the only signifier, mm. right? You know, a Malay man and his wife, and that was the only thing, just the word Malay. Do I remove it or don't I? I tell you, it was very difficult for me. Trauma, trauma, trauma. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Christian wasn't around, I couldn't consult with him. Mm. Anyway, I took a decision that I should leave it there. Mm. Because I realized that if I start changing what I had received mm. in, in actuality, and there was no intention to kill anybody really, no bad intentions at all. If I start doing that, I do not know how I could function subsequently as a playwright. Mm. So it's a, it's, it's, a private, it's a private ethical issue. I don't think it concerns anyone, but, mm. but it did have that, that impact on me. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I just wanted to quickly ask Sing On and um, Claire, what was it like working with a Japanese-speaking narrator? Did it change the dynamics a lot, or did you have to memorize, okay, this is the cue? Was it very technical? Because, I mean, I assume that you're not fluent in Japanese, so you have to wait for the word and then go. What was very interesting for me was this power dynamics between actor and director. Mm. Because we were just mere actors and we, were do, we do whatever we were told. But Hideko Yoshida was a star. <laughs> so one of the very first things was, if you, see, if you saw the scene earlier on, there would be someone moving, that was narrator yes, moving that's... things. She refused to move any furniture. She's, only an, actor. She's, just, she's an actor, she doesn't move furniture. <laughs> so who moved furniture? I remember who moved it in the end. Did you have uh, a stage hand or, or a stage manager? I who suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't remember. move oh, itself. No, no, I think we may have to move it ourselves, I think. Did we block? Yeah, I, may, I think we may have, may have had to. I don't to. remember these things. <laughs> I don't remember the good. So that was it. it, was, it was, again, it was a, it's, a, it's a different culture, right? If I have a particular person there. Claire. Yeah, I, I suppose it's interesting because they were they decided to make the Japanese uh, the, the narrator Japanese, mm. and therefore the idea that the narrator being the bridge, mm. um, and we did change some of the scenes. Mm. So in the scene between the mother and child, we mm. use Obisha. Uh, oh, oh, what was it? The Chinese, Japanese, um, the Japanese Okasan. 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 You know, we we did some changes in, right. in scripting, oh. uh, okay. but. Yes, I, I think it was a very short and in, short and intense re-rehearsal period for did, that. Did she understand what you were doing, or there was, a, was there was always an interpreter, and I also right. remember there were long sessions behind our backs. At least that's my sense. There was a lot of a negotiation between actor, I mean the narrator, and uh, the directors as far as the script and what was the, she had very 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 strong views about the play. Mm. Were you privy to this? I, I I quite distinctly remember that. So. Quickly summarize for me what your experience was like touring in this production in Japan. I mean, 
did you not see any of Japan or did you, did you get a day off? Did you get two hours off that you can go to Shibuya and then touch Shibuya and come back, you know? Was it just all work? Or? No, Chris, Christian is, is very good about food. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I think I, he, he just loves feeding and feeding us and sharing food with us. So, of course, for us, it was the first time going to uh, Tokyo. And, and I remember him taking us to these little izakayas uh, and uh, treating us to some nice meals. So that was very lovely. You know, he would be taking us to this little noodle shop or right. what have you. Uh, but I... I suppose it was it was actually a very tight, very mm, very yeah. tight because we performed in two two cities, cities. Tokyo and Yokohama, Yokohama. Uh, and the venues were very different. The, right. the, the Tokyo venue was beautiful. I think we were in, incredibly impressed with the the, the crew, the level of um, expertise that they had, mm. the, the level of the technical equipment was very very mm. up there. You know, yes. so, and I do remember that. Mm. The Yokohama was more like a civil. Hall yes. of some sort. Maybe that's where the lights are. Yeah. Civic Hall. Civic Hall, and yeah. then you did it in fluorescent But that lighting. was quite incredible, actually, to have performed it in a flat lighting, you know. Yeah. And then it's really, I suppose it must have intensified it even more because mm. it's really then just mm. about mm. the actors' bodies with barely anything else on stage. Because yeah. what I really liked early compared to Yokohama was then we realised how wonderful it was to have darkness that you could hide there and take a breather. <laughs> but in bright lights, you couldn't hide at all. So did you guys um, do the Singapore run first and then travelled? Singapore, or? KL, Japan. Right. So you had already, back to Singapore, you had your kind of like a run of it in Singapore. Did that help you when you travel? Because it's not, it's because some touring productions usually do overseas and then they come back. So what was that journey like for you as an actor? Did it make any impact that you started in Singapore and... Because I, I know a lot of people in 92 went to watch the single, they, they've never watched the 88. And they watched 92 and, they was, and people keep coming back to me. And I was in university at the time, so that it was really fantastic. So I don't remember any differences between the productions, except for the change in narrator. Mm. Do you, Claire? I you mean just within 92, yeah. Yeah. The, the, different, the fact that it was touring? Yeah. Not really, other than the usual excitement of, you know, how will this mm. new audience take it? Mm. Um, yeah, okay. I, I think you're so, we're so involved in the mm. getting the show up and mm. you have such a tight, a tight bump in time, etc. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, it just leaves me towards the end of this to just maybe a few. So, I'm just, this is um, what went down two days ago, well, well yesterday and the day before. Um, uh, Bumi Collective did a response to Three Children and those of you who managed to watch it, I thought it again was uh, recalling memories and I think if we hear what uh, the actors went through, it was also very much inhabiting the body, right? So without actually conferring a lot of what went down in 88 and 92, permeated into the body-centeredness of whatever the performances that were done here. So I just uh, wanted to acknowledge the actors and the directors that are here. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so we're coming to the end. I just wanted some last reflections. I think it's very... I, I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to talk about this because I think it was a very significant production and that really did did change a lot of focus and shifted a lot of attention onto the actor's craft, the centrality of the actor. First time you were treated to um, a, a local idiom, the aesthetics was local, the, 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 the tapping of in 88 at the time. So, any final reflections? We start with Preeti. You know, your earlier question, like, um after three children, I mean, would I do some, some changes? Possibly, I would link three children to, to recent you know, sociological work on the HDB flats, mm. you know, especially the book, like, this is what inequality looks like. Mm. You know? So I think that the issues of poverty, and, and, and poverty creates very strange conditions for mm. people. You know, I, I got the feeling that if we were to go to HDB flats right now and, and collect stories again, and mm. a, a, apart from the sociological research that was done, mm. that we could actually do a play and, and then we would, we would discover 
how present suffering uh, of the working class uh, is like, mm. you know, through the stories of HDB uh, residents now, actually. Mm. Yeah, so what I mean is the human condition is perpetuated. It's not, it's not solved. Mm. And mm. maybe, you know, there's, there's no solution to maybe that. Maybe there's... Oh. Yeah. Sing on, any last minute re response? Or you just... Um, come on, you were in this production. Yeah. No, I remember when I was doing it, I swore never ever to work with Christian and Big <laughs> Sam again. But you know, memory has a strange way of sort of uh, eliminating the, the less positive things. And I think if I were to ask to do it again mm. today with Christian and King Sam, I may just say yes. Mm. Wow. You heard it here <laughs> first at Center 42. Claire Wong. Final words. Looking back, I think that the play was very important in positioning within me the importance of telling our stories. Mm. Uh, I think it was the first play, the word multiculturalism, finding, finding myself as a person and as a performer, mm. uh, that I am multicultural mm. and that I am, and I love that, you know, I love that ease within, with which I can code switch, with I can embrace proudly that these are my traditions, mm. Western and different uh, Asian, particularly Southeast Asian mm. uh, traditions that I proudly can draw upon and it's mine. Mm. So I think that psychologically that was probably very important mm. for me. Looking back, I realised and it now continues to be what I'm very passionate about as a theatre maker mm. in, in collecting and telling stories our stories right now. And I think it's very beautiful what Britain has just said, mm. that what what are the, the what would the three children's stories now be in, in the HDB or mm. um, elsewhere in Singapore, Malaysia. Mm. And certainly as a director and a performer, more as a director, because I do a lot more directing mm. now, that has formed quite a bedrock of of the philosophy where I am so interested. It is about the actor. Because mm. when I go to watch a play, it is about the actor and mm. the writing. And, mm. and it, yes, you can take away everything, the lights, the, 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 the you know, um, set even. Uh, that is where the magic happens, yes. the power of the imagination. And mm. uh, my process is very much about um, facilitating the actor's process mm. in tapping into your own imagination, memory, and then uh, and and the the physicality that comes from that, whether or not it, it is a naturalistic or realistic play mm. or otherwise. So, I think the power of that is something that I am constantly curious about mm. and in search of um, to find and create a performance vocabulary a particular world mm. when we when I embark on um, directing a, a work. Uh, and I've sort of built from yeah. there, I believe, um, from that body of work that I, I was involved in in the 80s mm. all the way through to today. Right. Um, it's 6.30. Uh, we can open up the floor for some questions if you have. You know, please feel free to ask. If not, then, you know, we'll have some um, refreshments later if you want to mingle. Yes, Nora. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is for the playwright. Um, the two, you, you say you are a chronic reviser, but with the, with the both productions um, where the directors work so closely in drawing wanting uh, the, the actors to come up with things. How did that, I just want to know the nitty-gritty, how did that impact your text? I mean, did, you, did they say, we want to put this in, or we want to change this, or was there a negotiation between you, uh, between you and the directors? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, oh, you 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 have to understand Christian Jit. I don't know, <laughs> don't know about Onking Sen. Christian would never ask for rewrites. No, I never had to rewrite like a line even or throw out a word. No, Christian was a respecter of text, and for that reason, I loved him and I admire him. You know, but changes in the sense that you let's say Ang Tamui. I think I think there was only one key change really. Like Ang Tamui was in the first half, somewhere. 
and he, he or they moved Ang Tamui to be the opener for the second half. And that was it. And Christian had this peculiar habit. You see, if he didn't understand a text, like a particular section, he wouldn't remove it. He would, he would, work, he would work at it. So there was one seat, you know, I'm a chronic reviser in the sense that when it came to republishing a published text, I still revise. I took out one scene. The shoe scene, I took it out. Like, you know, shoe size 42, no, no, no. Because every time I watched it, my heart is in my mouth because it's very long. And it's, it's, it's my, because I felt the scene was very difficult to do and it was only, the payoff was very little. It was to get this sense of anxiety, of frustration, of always being guilty and always being wrong. And I felt I have so many parts where people were guilty and always being wrong. <laughs> I could take it out without sacrificing anything, and then I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, if there are no other pressing questions, it says, please join us downstairs to continue this conversation. Now, um, again, as closing... I just would like to express my greatest gratitude to these actors and to the playwright and King San and to the late Christian Jit for bringing three children to Singapore in 1988. It's one of the very few productions that really did change how I saw theatre. And as Claire said, that the magic is in the actor and the text and how the actor interacts with the text in that particular space. And as far as I'm concerned, the best storyteller in the world is the theatre. So I would please encourage you to support theatre and go to the theatre as often as you can. So would you put your hands together and thank these three lovely guests with me.